yeah, it's Brown History Month in which I, your humble servant, chronicle the history of action's greatest unsung movie star, Reb Brown. And we're kicking it off with a movie about kicking people in the head with a movie called Cage, in which Reb Brown teams with Lou Ferrigno to do battle with the seedy underground world of illegal cage fighting. I'm not gonna lie, this is probably the greatest film concept ever conceived by man. As with any Red Brown movie, it's required by law to at least begin in Vietnam so we can establish he has the skills of a natural leader. And of course, the ability to kill like a Category 5 hurricane made of bullets. But even though Reb's so good there's no one who can touch him in your whole damn army, he's forced to call for evac to save the lives of his men. At least that's what I think he's doing. I can't quite understand what he's saying. I can't be Blazer! <laughs> you do? I can't. His voice sounds like two dogs fighting. I don't know, all I hear is I'm about to take a dead animal! I don't give a shit to here now! The chopper arrives, and so everyone must now get to it. This scene is actually very impressive. It's pretty much the same opening they used in Tropic Thunder, so you know they were inspired by the very best. Reb barely gets to the chopper as it takes off, when suddenly... Oh! Oh crap! Lou! No! Check out how fucking badass Lou Ferrigno is, people. The man gets shot in the brain and he's still got a death grip like a crocodile. Oh, could someone give Hulk a hand? Head hurts and Reb Brown heavy. But amazingly, Lou survives! It takes more than brain damage to stop the Hulk, you don't use that anyhow. Reb helps him through rehab, but it's clear that Lou's lost a lot of his mental capacity from before. But at least his head wound's healed. Oh, sorry, the bandage is back. I guess I was mistaken. We are quickly introduced into the underworld cage fighting circuit, which is run by Mr. Takagi from Die Hard. He's also got two henchmen, the Asian version of the bad haircut guy from Highlander the Source, and the guy who steals a candy bar, also from Die Hard. So the candy bar guy and Mr. Takagi did work together at some point. I knew that whole Nakatomi thing was an inside job. Their champion is a pillowy overweight dude who doesn't exactly inspire the same fear as Bloodsport's reigning champion Chong Lee, who could totally kick this guy's ass. There's also a subplot where this lady journalist is wearing a disguise so lousy, I didn't even know she was supposed to be undercover until she started taking photos with the biggest camera ever made. Anyway, while we're here, we're also introduced to stereotypical Mama Luke's Tony and Mario, who just lost a ton of money betting on the other guy. I thought you said that Mon Nyan could fight. He's a professional wrestler. Yeah, well, this ain't professional wrestling, man. Hey, what? I mean, next thing you'll tell me is that professional wrestlers don't fight for real. We were um, looking for a fighter to do better. No doubt. Well, look, I plan to pay you, but I just need a few days. Very well. You have three days. Goodbye, Mr. Buckler. The Goombas aren't the only ones with financial troubles, though. Reb and Lou owe big money to the bank to pay off the bar they manage. Maybe they should look into the heavy use of product placement. Nah, but suddenly I am thirsty for a cool, delicious Coors Light beer! Their old friend Mimi says she's willing to loan them $10,000, but Reb won't hear of it. I'm not really sure where Reb plans to get the money on his own, but maybe he's hoping Lou here has a career in competitive eating. Oh, no, no, no. Hulk like clam chowder. Anyway, the Goombas happen to go to the very same bar just as Reb gets hassled by a bunch of stereotypical Hispanic gang members. Oh, was that supposed to be a euphemism? Because 
I choose not to get it. By the way, I don't know if you heard this, but the weirdest part of the scene is the fact that a half dozen times you can hear this weird electronic sound. How are you? Jump! I don't know, let me see. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Really, what is that? I can't even say it's background noise because I can hear it over the music and the dialogue most times. The soft furry cherry. What, is R2-D2 serving drinks off camera? The thugs cause a fight, and in the ruckus, they accidentally break loose concentration and cost them the autistic Donkey Kong record high score, and that makes him mad. Oh, and I'm sure it was a complete coincidence this back room is awash in gamma ray green light. Hulk strongest one there is! So anyway, long story short, they take out the trash, leave the thugs laying, and... Probably make me a wad the boot. Yeah. Again with the noise! Was it this vitally necessary to establish this place as a fucking pinball machine? Mario and Tony try to convince Reb to be their new fighter, but he's not interested. So they hire the East Side stereotypes to burn down their bar in the daytime when nobody's around. Nobody gets hurt. Orale. Give me the gas can on this. Give me the fucking gas can, Mundo! Sure, the apple. Sure, man. Huh? I don't even know why I hired you, man! Naturally, there is someone in the bar when the guy sneaks in and throws a Molotov cocktail, and poor Mimi burns to death. <coughs> Whoa! -ho! Man, that alcohol really goes up in a flash. <laughs> At least he kept a low profile, huh? Dumbass Mexican lowlife scum. The police tell our heroes about the arson and death of their friend, leading to one of the greatest moments in acting I've ever seen. Lou Ferrigno and Red Brown crying together on camera. Sorry, Billy. I'm gonna miss her a lot, too. <laughs> Billy, tell Hulk about Disneyland. Meanwhile, we catch up on the continuing saga of the reporter watching the villains do light janitorial work. This scene goes on for like four minutes, and I fucking swear to you, this is the most irrelevant subplot in the history of cinema. This lady has no reason to be in this movie. Who does she work for? Why does she continue to endanger herself even though she's already got photos of the fights and the location of the secret arena? These things are never explained! While Reb is arguing with the insurance lady over the burned bar... Stick it, lady. Mario and Tony take Lou out for lunch. Der Hulk likes Subway. They start to butter him up by talking about the stuff he likes to do. Ooh, strong. Say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm smart. I got 375 and 540 on the Master Blaster. Jeez. Master Blaster? What is he talking about? It's a video game, Tony. Master Blaster? I don't think I ever played that one. It must have been in the Mad Max series. I think I stopped playing that series once I got beyond Thunderdome. Oh! Oh, I did it again! I cannot be stopped! And you'd like to see it rebuilt, right? Sure. That's where me and Scott work. You'd do whatever you could to help Scott rebuild the bar, wouldn't you? Sure. Sure. Now listen, Billy. The quickest way for us to get some money is for you to wrestle this Chinese guy named Chang. Wrestling? Yeah. I like wrestling. <laughs> but I don't like fighting. But I like to wrestle. But I don't like fighting. But I like to wrestle. But I don't like fighting. But I like to wrestle. I like wrestling. With Lou missing in action, Reb goes to the police to track him down, but they're unhelpful. Seeing as how they're so stupid they need missing persons department written on the inside of their door window, it's pretty safe to assume they couldn't find their own ass with both hands on a search warrant. 
Why is that there, in case the guy forgets where he works? Reb takes matters into his own hands and starts strong-arming every gang member he sees. Crazy man, he's got no fucking brain, no fucking head! I'm looking for an asshole with a devil tattooed on his arm. I don't know, man! Wrong answer, amigo! You're wearing a bandana with the same colors. I swear I don't know how! Tell me now, asshole! You know, if Reb Brown steps on your throat and starts asking you questions, you'd better answer because, believe me, the guy does not fuck around. Just for making a mask twice, he goes to the gang's favorite hangout and just embarks on a killing spree with his shotgun. It's fucking Judgment Day in this place. Hey, asshole! You ain't gonna shoot a lady, are you, dickhead? The real arsonist speeds away in his car, resulting in a high-speed chase. More gang members join the chase, clearly having no idea who they're fucking with. Ah, lovely, the rare fruit stand slash corkscrew aerial crash. This fucking genius drives right back to his boss, who starts the battle by groveling like a broken man. When that doesn't work, he changes tactics to the historically proven made you look man gambit. It was mortals, it was the guy, it was mortals! So he had all that time to find a new weapon, and the best he could come up with was a 2x4. Reb finds a Molotov cocktail and a hot plate in like a second. Dude, Reb Brown is fucking sick, man. He'll set your ass on fire just to watch you fucking burn, because that's how he rolls. Only Reb Brown could set a man on fire and still be cold as ice. Meanwhile, that lady reporter is still following Endo from Lethal Weapon around, snapping pictures with that goddamn camera the size of a Claymore mine. Jesus, Fletch was less conspicuous than this. You really think you're fooling anyone, Miss Garrett? If it isn't one of Yin's slime balls, Tiger Joe. <laughs> Tiger Joe? Dude sounds like a character from Super Punch Out. Tiger Joe tries to warn the reporter off, since she couldn't be any more obvious if she was on stilts and wearing a flak jacket with the word press on the back. Unfortunately, Tiger Joe is recognized by the local mafia boss Costello, and they're both captured. Long dong, ain't it? Or is it no dong? What's the meaning of this? This guy's a cop. His name is Joe Lau. What? I said this asshole is a cop. He shot two of my guys about three years ago, then he disappeared. Yeah, I mean, if only he'd shaved his face, or cut his hair, or stopped giving out his real name, I might never have recognized the guy, but sometimes you just get lucky, I guess. Mr. Takagi agrees to let Lou wrestle in the cage, but not against the champ. Not yet. First, he has to win a number one contenders match, but uh, it's pretty clear he doesn't fully understand what's going on. Hi, I'm Billy. Fuck you! Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You're gonna make him angry, and believe me, you wouldn't like him when he's angry. I still can't believe I'm watching a brain damaged dude in a mixed martial arts cage match. I think the only way we could make this whole thing any more wrong is if we made the brain damaged dude fight the autistic chick from chocolate. <laughs> Yes, interesting match. I haven't been this uncomfortable watching a mentally handicapped person wrestle since Eugene in the WWE. Yeah, but the point is, Billy won. And now we get to fight Chang. It would seem so. How about next week? The match will take place in 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Are you crazy? Oh, look, now wait a minute, Mr. Yen. You can't do this. Now, Billy's exhausted here. He needs rest. Quite so. To fight the champion, it is 13 minutes. What? You mean the guy running the sleazy illegal underground fighting ring is untrustworthy? Reb manages to find the cage fights, but subtlety isn't exactly his strong suit, so he gets captured immediately and thrown in a cell along with Tiger Joe and the reporter chick. This is where all the subplots supposedly tie together, but none of it really makes any sense. Tiger Joe just kind of hangs out the whole movie, not really saying anything, and suddenly the lady is clinging to Reb like lint in a dryer trap. 
They haven't known each other five minutes and already they're romantically involved? Poor Lou got hurt pretty bad in the last fight and doesn't really want to fight anymore. I don't want to fight no more. That man didn't bust up by the wall. Listen, you big jerk. You don't fight, you die, and there ain't no rules. You understand? I don't want to fight no more, Mario. I'll take Sky with fucking God. Don't do that, Tony! Oh, oh shit! Everyone run for your lives! He's hulking out! <laughs> Reb starts a fire, hoping to set off the smoke alarm so the guards open the door. This plan banks heavily on the thugs caring whether or not their prisoners die of smoke inhalation, which, I'm guessing since they were planning on killing them later anyway, the answer would be no. But it worked, so what do I know? Lou gets in the cage to fight Chang, which has surprisingly little drama to it since we know basically nothing about one of the main villains of the movie. In fact, he hasn't said a single solitary word the entire film. Lu starts off well, but Chang regains the edge with a well-placed kick to the yambags. That's when Chang starts punching him in his... uh... brain damage? This causes Lu to experience non-flashbacks that send him into a killing frenzy! Oh, great. Now we've got a brain-damaged 300-pound bodybuilder who's also retard strong and who hallucinates other people are Viet Cong. He's the ultimate weapon! Mr. Takagi's not gonna be happy about this! Mr. Costello has won a great deal of money for me tonight. I intend to have a chance to get it back! Yeah, well, Billy ain't fighting anymore. That is incorrect. He will fight again in 13 minutes or he will die, as will you, Mr. McClough! <laughs> How much money does he really plan to make back betting against a guy who's already fought two straight matches and who can barely walk now? The fighter has a match in 30 minutes. Yeah, but you see, nobody's gonna bet on a guy who's nearly comatose. Your fighter has a match in 30 minutes. You're booking TNA Impact, aren't you? No, he must meet my new challenger, Forfeit. Okay, fine. He forfeits. If he forfeits, we will kill him. We will kill all of you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you do? Make up the damn rules as you go along? Yes. It's my illegal sporting event. The challenger he's talking about is the East Coast champion. No, actually, it's just some other guy we don't know who's just now being introduced to us ten minutes before the end of the movie. Reb takes Lou's place in the cage, and betting begins anew. Costello and his henchman, Machete, decide to up the stakes. Okay, Mr. Yen, let's get serious now. I'll wager 500,000 bucks. I would think you were even more serious if you said one million dollars. Danny! <laughs> Open it up. That's not a million dollars! That case is the size of my fucking laptop bag! You know, you really gotta feel sorry for the poor fool trapped in a steel cage with Reb Brown. Lesser men have been known to wither to ash at the sound of his throat-peeling battle cry alone. Did Pierre Kirby ever do battle in a steel cage? No, I tell you, sir, he has not! <laughs> That's when the movie suddenly turns into a fucking peckinpah climax. Mr. Takagi tells his henchmen to just open fire and fucking everyone dies. The mobster is Costello, it's a massacre. Billy freaks the hell out and throws Mr. Takagi in the dreaded bear hug. Billy, let him go! Let him go! Oh my god, he just crushed that dude's ribcage like a styrofoam cup. That was such a nice suit, too. John Phillips of London. I have two myself. And still the reporter chick is clinging to Reb! I don't think they've said a single goddamn word to one another the whole movie! Tiger Joe throws them the million dollars and has about seven years of weird paperwork to do, but otherwise it seems like all's well that ends well. Or does it?!
We'll fight again in 30 minutes. Oh, God, my back.